Hello squirrels, it's time for our book reading. We're on chapter 9 called Tender Troubles. Joe, I'm anxious about Beth. Why, Mother? She seemed unusually well since the babies came. It's not her health that troubles me now, it's her spirits. I'm sure there's something on her mind and I want you to, to discover what it is. What makes you think so, Mother? She sits alone a good deal and doesn't talk to her father as much as she used. I found her crying over the babies the other day when she sings. The songs are always sad ones. And now and then I see a look in her face that I don't understand. That This isn't like Beth and it worries me. Have you asked her about it? I've tried once or twice, but she either evaded my questions or looked so distressed that I stopped. I never force my children's confidence, and I seldom have to look, have to wait for long. Mrs. March glanced at Joe as she spoke, but the face opposite seemed quite unconscious of any secret disquiet but Beth's. And after sewing thoughtfully for a minute, Joe said, I think she's growing up, and so begins to dream dreams and have hopes and fears and fidgets without knowing why or being able to explain them. Why, Mother Beth's 18, but we don't realize it and treat her like a child, forgetting she's a woman. So she is, dear heart. How fast you do grow up, returned her mother with a sigh and a smile. Can't be helped, Marmy, so you must resign yourself to all sorts of worries and let your birds hop out of the nest one by one. I promise never to hop very far, if that is of any comfort to you. <laughs> it's a great comfort, Joe. I always feel strong when you are at home. Now Meg is gone. Beth is too feeble and Amy too young to depend upon, but when the tug comes, you're always ready. Well, you know I don't mind hard job jobs much, and there must always be one scrub in, in a family. Amy is splendid in fine works, and I'm not, but I feel in my element when all the carpets are to be taken up or half the family falls sick at once. Amy is distinguishing herself <clears throat> abroad, but if anything is amiss at home, I'm your man. I leave Beth to your hands then, for she will open her tender little heart, her tender little heart to her Joe sooner than to anyone else. Be very kind and don't let her think anyone watches or talks about her. If she only would get quite strong and cheerful again, I shouldn't have a wish in the world. Happy woman, I've got heaps. My dear, what are they? I'll settle Bethy's troubles and then I'll tell you mine. They're not very wearing, so they'll keep. And Joe stitched away with a wise nod which set her mother's heart at rest for all the present, for, wait a minute, at rest about her for the present, at least. While apparently absorbed in her own affairs, Joe watched Beth, and after many conflicting conjectures, finally settled upon one which seemed to explain the change in her. A slight incident gave Joe the clue to the mystery, she thought, and lively, fancy loving heart did the rest. She was affecting to write busily one Saturday afternoon when she and Beth were alone together. Yet as she scribbled, she kept her eye on her sister, who seemed unusually quiet, sitting at the window. Beth's work often dropped into her lap, and she leaned her head upon her hand in a dejected attitude, while her eyes rested on the dull autumnal landscape. Suddenly, someone passed below, whistling, whistling like an operatic blackbird, and a voice called out, All serene, coming in tonight. Beth started, leaned forward, smiled and nodded, watched the passerby till his quick tramp died away. Then said softly as if to herself, How strong and well and happy that dear boy looks. Hmm said Joe, still intent upon her sister's face, for the bright color faded as quickly as it came. The smile vanished, and presently a tear lay shining on the window ledge. Beth whisked it off, half an, and in her half-averted face read a tender sorrow that made her own eyes fill. Fearing to betray herself, she slipped away, murmuring something about needing more paper. 
Mercy on me. Beth loves Laurie, she said, sitting down in her own room, pale with the shock of the discovery which she believed she had just made. I never dreamed of such a thing. What will Mother say? I wonder if her... There, Joe stopped and turned scarlet with a sudden thought. If he shouldn't love back again, how dreadful it would be. He must. I'll make him. And she shook her head threateningly at the picture of the mischievous-looking boy laughing at her from the wall. Oh, dear, we're growing up with a vengeance. Here's Meg married and a mama, Amy flourishing away at Paris, and Beth in love. I'm the only one that has sense enough to keep out of mischief. <laughs> Joe thought intently for a minute with her eyes fixed on the picture. Then she smoothed out a wrinkled forehead and said, with a decided nod at the face opposite. No, thank you, sir. You've been very char you're very charming, but you're no more you've no more stability than a weathercock, so you needn't write touching notes and smile in that insinuating way, for it won't do a bit of good, and I won't have it. Then she sighed and fell into a reverie from which she did not wake till the early twilight sent her down to take new observations which only confirmed her suspicion. <clears throat> mm, hang on. I've lost my spot. We're all gone. Sitting at the window. Uh, oh, here I am. Uh, and I won't have it. Then she sighed and fell into a reverie from which she did not wake till the early twilight sent her down to take new observations which only confirmed her suspicion. Though Laurie flirted with Amy and joked with Joe, his manner to Beth had always been particularly kind and gentle, but so was everybody's. Therefore, no one thought of imagining that he cared more for her than for the others. Indeed, a general impression had prevailed in the family of late that our boy was getting fonder than ever of Joe who, however, wouldn't hear a word upon the subject and scolded violently if anyone dared to suggest it. If they had known the various tender passages which had been nipped in the bud, they would have had the immense satisfaction of saying, I told you so. But Joe hated philandering and wouldn't allow it, always having a joke or smile ready at the least sign of impending danger. When Laurie first came to college, he fell in love about once a month but these small flames were as brief as ardent, did no damage, and much amused Joe, who took great interest in the alter alternations of hope, despair, and resignation, which were confided to, to her in their weekly conferences. But there came a time when Laurie ceased to worship at many shrines, hinted darkly at one all-absorbing passion, and, and indulged occasionally in Byronic fits of gloom. Then he avoided the tender subject altogether, wrote philosophical notes to Joe, turned studious, and gave out that he was going to dig, intending to graduate in a blaze of glory. This suited the young lady better than twilight confidences, tender pressures of the hand and eloquent glances of the eye, for with Joe, brain developed earlier than heart, and she preferred imaginary heroes to real ones, because when tired of them, the former could be shut up in a tin kitchen, in a tin kitchen till called for, and the la and the latter were less manageable. Things were in this state when the grand discovery was made, and Joe watched Laurie that night as she had never done before. If she had not got the new idea into her head, she would have seen nothing unusual in the fact that Beth was very quiet and Laurie very kind to her. But having given the rein to her lively fancy, it galloped away with her at a great pace. And common sense, being rather weakened by a long course of, roman of romance writing, did not come to the rescue. 
As usual, Beth lay on the sofa and Laurie sat in a low chair close by, amusing her with all sorts of gossip, for she depended on her weekly spin and he never disappointed her. But that evening, Joe fancied that Beth's eyes rested on the lively dark face beside her with peculiar pleasure and that she looked and that she listened with intense interest to an account of some exciting cricket match. Though the phrases caught off a tice, t stumbled off his ground, and the leg hit for three were as intelligible to her as Sanskrit, she f also fancied, having set her heart upon seeing it, that she saw a certain increase of gentlemanness in... <coughs> of gentlemanness... In Laurie's manner, then he dropped his voice now and then, laughed less than usual, was a little absent-minded, and settled the afghan over Beth's feet with an uh, assiduity that was really almost tender. Who knows? Stranger things have happened, thought Joe as she fussed about the room. She'll make quite an angel of him, and he will, <clears throat> he will make life delightfully easy and pleasant for the deer if they only love each other. I don't see how he can help it, and I do believe he would if the rest of us were out of the way, as everyone was out of the way but herself. Joe began to feel that she ought to dispose of herself with all speed, but where should she go? And burning to lay herself upon the shrine of sisterly devotion, she sat down to settle that point. Now the old sofa was a regular patriarch of a sofa, long, broad, well-cushioned, and low, a trifle shabby as well it might be, for the girls had slept and sprawled on it as babies, fished over the back, rode on the arms, and had menageries under it as children. And let's see, and rested tired heads, dreamed dreams, and listened to tender talk on it as young women. They all loved it, for it was a family refuge, and one con corner had always been Joe's favorite lounging place. Among the many pillows that adorned the venerable couch was one hard round, uh, one hard round, covered with prickly horse hair, and furnished with a knobby button at each end. This repulsive pillow was her especial property. <laughs> being used as a weapon of desire, a barricade, or terms, <clears throat> or a stern prevention of too much slumber. Laurie knew this pillow well and had cause to regard it with deep aversion, having been unmercifully pummeled with it in former days when tempting was allowed, and now frequently debarred by it from the seat he most coveted next to Joe in the safe corner. If the sausage, as they called it, stood on end to end, it was, let's see, end to end, it was a sight that he might approach and repose, but if it lay flat across the sofa, woe to man, woman, or child who dared disturb it. That night, Joe forgot to barricade her door and had not, <clears throat> been in her seat five minutes before a massive form appeared beside her and with both arms spread over the sofa back, both long legs stretched out before him, Laurie exclaimed with a sigh, a sigh of satisfaction. Now this is filling at the price. No slang, snapped Joe, slamming down the pillow, but it was too late. There was no room for it. And caught and coasting onto the floor, it disappeared in a most mysterious manner. Come, Joe, don't be thorny. After studying himself to a skeleton all, all the week, a fellow deserves putting, deserves petting and ought to get by. Beth will pet you. I'm busy. No, she's not to be bothered with me, but you like that sort of thing unless you're, unless you've suddenly lost your taste for it, have you? Do you hate your boy and want to fire pillows at him? Anything more wheedlesome than, <laughs> wheedlesome than that touching appeal was seldom heard, but Joe quenched her boy by turning on him with a stern query. How many bouquets have you sent Miss Randall this week? Not one, upon my word. She's engaged. 
Now then, <laughs> I'm glad of it. That's one of your foolish extravagances, sending flowers and things to girls for whom you don't care two pins, continued Joe reprovingly. Sensible girls for whom I do care, whole papers of pins won't let me send them flowers and things, so what can I do? My feelings need a vent. Mother doesn't approve of flirting even in fun, and you do fl flirt desperately, Teddy. I'd give anything if it if I could answer. So do you. <clears throat> uh, as well I can, I'll merely say that I don't see any harm in that pleasant little game if all parties understand that it's only play. Well, it does look pleasant, but I can't learn how it's done. I've tried because one feels awkward in company not to do as everybody else is doing, and I don't seem to get on, said Joe, forgetting to play mentor. Take lessons of Amy. <laughs> of Amy, she has a regular talent for it. Yes, she does it very prettily and never seems to go too far. I suppose it's natural to some people to please without trying, and others to always say no. <clears throat> Wait a minute. And others to always say and do the wrong thing in the wrong place. I'm glad you can't flirt. It's really refreshing to see a sensible, straightforward girl who can be jolly and kind without making a fool of herself. Between ourselves, Joe, some of the girls I know really do go really do go on at such a rate I'm ashamed of them. They don't mean any harm, I'm sure, but if they knew how we fellas talked about them afterward, they'd mend their ways, I fancy. They do the same, and as their tongues, uh, as their tongues are the sharpest, you fellas get the worst of it. For you are as silly as they every bit. If you behaved properly, they would. But knowing you, like their nonsense, they keep it up, and then you can blame them, and then you blame them. Much you know about it, ma'am, said Laurie in a superior tone. We don't like romps and flirts, though we may act as if we did sometimes. The pretty, modest girls are never talked about except respectfully among gentlemen. Bless your innocent soul. If you could be in my place for a month, you'd see things that would astonish you a trifle. Upon my word, when I see one of those... Uh, harem scarum girls I always want to say with our I always want to say with our friend Cock Robin out upon you fie upon you bold faced jig <laughs> it was impossible to help laughing at the funny conflict between Laurie's chivalrous reluctance to speak ill of womankind and his very natural dislike of the unfeminine folly of which fashionable society showed him many samples. Joe knew that young Lawrence was regard regarded as a most eligible party by worldly mamas and such smiled and wait a minute was much smiled upon by their daughters and flattered enough by ladies of all ages to make a coxcomb of him so so she watched rather jealously fearing he would be spoiled and rejoiced more than she confessed to find that he still behaved in modern girls returning suddenly to hear her admonitory tone uh, blah, blah, blah. she said dropping her voice if you must have a vent teddy go and devote yourself to one of the pretty modest girls whom you do respect and not waste your time with the silly ones you really advise it and laurie looked at her with an odd mixture of anxiety and merriment in his face yes i do but you'd better work <clears throat> Wait till you are through college on the other side. <laughs> or no, wait a minute. On the whole, yes, I do. But you'd better wait till you're through college on the whole and be fitting yourself for the place. Meantime, you're not half good enough for well. 
whoever the modest girl may be, and Joe looked a little queer likewise, for a name had almost escaped her. That I'm not, acquiesced Joe with an expression of humiliated humility quite new to him as he dropped his eyes and absently wound Joe's apron tassel round, uh, round his finger. Mercy on us, this will never do, thought Joe, adding aloud. Go and sing to me. I'm dying for some music and I always like yours. I'd rather stay here, thank you. Well, you can't. There isn't a room and there isn't room. Go and make yourself useful since you're too big to be ornamental. <laughs> I thought you hated to be tied to a woman's apron string, retorted Joe, quoting certain rebellious words of his. Ah, uh, that depends on who wears the apron, and Laurie gave an auda audacious tweak at the tassel. Are you going, demanded Joe, driving, uh, diving for the pillow. He fled at once in the minute and the minute it was well up with the bonnets of Bonnie Dundee she slipped away to return no more till the young gentleman departed in high dungeon Joe lay long awake that night and was just dropping off when the sound of a stifled sob made her fly to bed Joe's uh, Beth's bedside with the anxious inquiry what is it dear I thought you were asleep sobbed Beth is it the old pain, my precious? No, it's a new one, but I can bear it. And Joe tried to check her tears. Tell me about it. Let me cure it as often as I often did the other. You can't. There is no cure. There, Beth's voice gave way, and clinging to her sister, she cried so despairingly that Joe was frightened. Where is it? Shall I call mother? No, no, don't call her. Don't tell her. I'll soon be better. Lie down here and pour in see lie down here and pour my head. I'll be quiet and go to sleep. Indeed I will. Joe obeyed, but as her hand went softly to and fro across Beth's hot forehead and wet eyelids, her eye, her heart was very full and she longed to speak. But young as she was, Joe had learned that hearts like flowers cannot be rudely handled, but must open naturally. So though she believed she knew the cause of Beth's new pain, it's fruit flies or something in here, and I don't have any fruit, uh, she said in the tenderest tone, does anything trouble you, dearie? Yes, Joe, after a long pause, wouldn't it comfort you to tell me what it is? Not now, not yet. Then I won't ask, but remember, Bethy, that Mother and Joe and I are always glad to hear and help if we can. <clears throat> bloody, bloody, bloody. I know what I'll tell you by and by. Is the pain better now? Oh, yes, much better. You are so comfortable, Joe. Go to sleep, dear. I'll stay with you. Uh. Mm -mm 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 -mm. So, cheek to cheek, they fell asleep, and on the morrow, Beth seemed quite herself again. And for at eighteen, neither heads nor hearts ache long, and a loving word can medicine most ills. But Joe had made up her mind, and after pondering over a project for some days, she confided it to her mother. You asked me the other day what my wishes were, and I'll tell you one of them. I'll tell you, one of the marmies, she began as they sat along together. I want to go away somewhere this winter for a change. Why, Joe? And her mother looked up at her quickly as if the world's suggested a, uh, suggested a double meaning. I think I'm going to have to stop there, guys. I hope I'm not right at the end, but I'm about to read myself to sleep. Okay, and I hope to see you guys live at five in less than an hour. <laughs> Get me a little power nap right quick. Make some tea. Or make me some strong tea and drink it. And then make another one for the live. See you soon.
Love you. Bye-bye.